Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day you're joining me, great. I'm glad that you're here and learning chemistry, following along in your apology, a textbook, exploring creation with chemistry. Today, we're gonna get started with module three. Let's get into it. It starts on page 69. So make sure that you have your textbook open and that you are following along. Uh, we're gonna start talking about atoms and molecules. Chemists like to study matter because chemistry is the study of matter. And so when early chemists and early scientists were trying to understand matter, they came up with a couple of different theories. The first theory was the continuous theory of matter, trying to understand exactly what matter was and how it could be broken down. Let's take some notes. Module atoms and molecules. And the first section is on early attempts to understand matter. Anybody remember what matter is? Say it in your head right now. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space, okay? Uh, so when scientists were first beginning to understand matter, they came up with, like I said before, the continuous, continuous theory of matter. Now this was way back in ancient times. So the ancient Greeks and philosophers uh, put this forth as one theory of how to understand matter. I bet you didn't know you were gonna be studying a little bit of history with your chemistry. The continuous theory of matter said that matter is made up of long chains of blobs, just like this. So all pieces of matter, all substances, can be stretched out or broken in half over and over and over. Ooh, this is some good slimy slime. Okay, so I just, I have this continuous uh, bit of matter here. I just broke it into a piece. I can break it and stretch it and break it into another section. And I can break it into Stop it. Get some help. Maybe another section. And I can break it into another section. So the continuous theory of matter said that, splat, said that matter could continue to be divided into smaller and smaller bits. So as long as you had a strong enough magnifying glass or a small enough little knife, you can just keep breaking apart matter into tinier and tinier pieces. Okay? That's the continuous theory of matter. So think of continuous, think of slime. Ew, now my hands are all gross. Okay, then uh, thousands of years later, in about 400 BC, a Greek philosopher came up with the discontinuous, discontinuous theory of matter. Okay, now while this was the ancient, this was the ancient Greek belief, this was in about 400 B.C. So 400 years before Jesus Christ walked the earth. And the Greek philosopher that came up with this, his name was Democritus. Let's give credit where credit's due, right? Because this guy was actually onto something. This was the first train of thought that really was getting close to our modern understanding of matter, which is that it is made up of 
tiny particles called atoms. So Democritus didn't exactly come up with the atoms, but he did believe that, or at least he put forth the idea, that matter wasn't necessarily always continuous, but instead, while it looked like it was one substance, like if you're on a beach, you can look at the beach in the sand and it looks like it could be one long blob of sand, but really, those blobs are made up of teeny tiny little particles. And I have some sand right here that, I don't know, you probably can't see that it's falling into little tiny pieces, but that's the discontinuous theory of matter, is that it's not just a continuous chain, but matter is actually comprised of tiny little particles. Ding, 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 he was right. Now my hands are really gross. Okay, then, so that was 400 BC. So then, a couple thousand years later, 1700 AD, we have a scientist by the name of Antoine Lavoisier. Antoine Lavoisier introduced to us the law of conservation conservation means saving, okay? The law of conservation of mass. Which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only, I'm going to add a semicolon there, it can only, whoops, only change forms. Okay? Now, of course, there was a creator at the beginning of time, right, who created all of the matter that we know and get to enjoy today, our creator, God. But once he created all of that matter, the matter has not gone anywhere. All of the mass, um, all of the mass has, all of the matter has retained the same amount of mass. It just changes forms. So what do we mean by that? Let's think of an example. An example would be wood burning. Okay. When you start a piece of wood on fire, and actually I'm going to start a little campfire right here. Just kidding. I wish I could. Um, when you have wood burning, ta-da, a fire. Here, let me show you what's burning. Okay, so I lit some paper and some cardboard and a couple little twigs on fire. So, what Lavoisier was saying was that when matter appears like it's burning up and it's being destroyed, it's really not. This wood, this cardboard, this paper, is the matter in it is not being destroyed, it's merely changing forms. When you burn something, you change it from its original form into carbon dioxide, gas, you change it into water, water vapor or steam that's leaving, and you change it into ash. And so that's what's happening here. If we could actually weigh the take the mass of the cardboard, the paper, and the twigs before it was burned, and then take the mass of the carbon dioxide, the water vapor, and the uh, ash after the fire, you would see that the two masses are equal. Isn't that amazing? Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Are you surprised though? Would God really create a planet and give people or give the earth the capability of destroying itself and destroying the matter on the earth? No, it would not, and neither can we create matter. That job solely belongs to the Lord. So we just saw an example of the law of conservation of matter. Pretty cool. Next, let's take a look at experiment, or excuse me, example 3.1, and we're gonna see how this actually plays itself out in a scientific experiment. Speaking of experiments, you should read experiment 3.1 
on page 71. We're going to perform this experiment together in class, if you are in my chemistry class. Um, and we are going to see the conservation of mass and this law actually happening. Oh, here comes a small amount of mass in the form of my daughter. Jake, can you take her and continue playing with her? Thank you. And example 3.1 is what we're going to look at next. This is on page 73, so I'm first going to read it. A chemist notices that when given enough energy, a certain white powder changes into two different substances, tin and oxygen. A chemist watches 151 grams of powder undergo this change. The chemist easily collects the tin that was formed and measures its mass to be 119 grams. Unfortunately, the chemist could not collect the oxygen that was formed and therefore could not determine its mass. Use the law of mass conservation to help the chemist determine how much oxygen was made. All right, so I'm gonna do this in red. This is example 3.1. Example 3.1. In practical terms, the law of conservation of mass, here it is right here, I'm gonna underline it. I think I may have been continuing to call it the law of conservation of matter. I'm sorry, I mean the law of conservation of mass. The matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's the mass that we can measure from it. So the mass of the powder that this chemist began with, according to Lavoisier, must be equal to the mass of tin that was produced plus the mass of oxygen that was produced because none of this matter could have been destroyed. So its mass must be equal to the mass after the reaction, the chemical reaction happens. So if we rearrange our uh, formula here and I'm just gonna have to use my sweatshirt because I forgot my eraser okay I'm running out of room so I'm just gonna erase this and rearrange it with our algebraic uh, intelligences so that we know that the mass of the oxygen must then equal the mass of the powder, what we started with, minus the mass of the tin. Okay? Because what we are trying to find in this problem is the mass of oxygen created. Okay, let's work this out. So the mass of oxygen must equal the mass of the powder, which was 151 grams, minus the mass of the tin, which was 119 grams. Whoops, 119 grams, which equals 32 grams of oxygen. And it's always a good idea to circle your answer. Circle your answer, remember your units. Are we still in grams? Well, we've subtracted grams from grams, which is good because you really can only add and subtract like terms and like units, right? We learned that in module one. So our answer is gonna be in grams. And let's take a look also at significant figures. When you're adding and subtracting, uh, using significant figures, you look at the least, you look, look at the uh, smallest decimal place of the numbers that you are working with. So our smallest decimal place is the one decimal place. And so we are going to end up with an answer only to the ones decimal place, which would be the two right here. So we have the correct number of significant figures. We have uh, the correct units and our answer is 32 grams of oxygen was created. So just because that chemist could not measure the oxygen coming off of her reaction, doesn't mean that she couldn't figure out how much oxygen was there. 
And that, my friends, is an example of the law of conservation of mass. And we will continue on looking at what's next. Elements, the basic building blocks of matter, coming up next.